Y'all doing good this morning? morning. Everybody doing good? Good. Well, good. Listen, I want to share something that God put on my heart this week, and I dealt with it um, all week long. Um, Many of you probably don't know much about how I think in my head. Um, I don't even know if my wife even knows half the time what I think sometimes. Um, But I'm a very simple guy. Very simple. Like, I don't, it stresses me out when things aren't simple. If I have one thing going on major in a day, um, typically I will revolve my entire day around that one thing that I have going on. Um, I mean, no matter what it is, I'm just simple. I can't handle um, just a lot of things coming at me. Um, Now, I know a lot of people, like my wife, she can handle 50,000 things. She stresses me out. Um, Just watching, like running, and all the stuff that she does. And a lot of people can handle that. I'm just too simple for that. I, I, I'm simple. And uh, so this, this week I had to go to Utah um, for work. And so I was flying in on Monday, flying back out on Friday. And so whenever I, I you all know what I, when I, when I tell you, I look for things and, and uh, churches to go to, and I look for things to do that, um, that are basically God things. And so this week God showed me something on the way out there um, that really put things in perspective and made me think about it all week long to form where you're getting ready to hear. And so it was real simple. Me and my wife had to get up at 4.30 in the morning on Monday. Um, I had to be at the airport at 6.30 in the morning. I was catching the, the flight at 8.30. Um, I was going to be dropping in to Utah at 10.30 um, because they're two hours behind, so it was like a four-hour flight. And it was all going so perfect, right? I mean, I had spent a month and a half getting everything in line to where this day wouldn't stress me out so that I'd be like, I know, I know when I, what times I got to be there. I would always get, no matter what I'm doing, I always try to get there early anyway just so I know that things are in line with the schedule of things that I have to do. And it was all working perfectly. So I showed up at the airport and I walked. As soon as I got through the gates, they won't let you take any drinks or anything. So as soon as I get through the, the, the guards, uh, you know, the checkpoints and all that, I get me a pop and I put it in my, my uh, backpack so I can have it if I want it on the flight. And the flight's going great, everything, everything's on time. And, and I get down, drop down, and I get my rental car. And I go out, and as soon as I sit in my rental car, I'm like, okay, all I have to do is drive like 10 minutes to the airport, and this day is over, and tonight is Monday night football, because I love football, right? Like, I, mean, I, just, I mean, that's just how I am. And I knew I was going to be able to sightsee a little bit on the first day there. And so I, I get into the car, and I throw my gym bag in there, and I sit down in the driver's seat, and they tell me, they're like, okay, you got a 2019 um, you know, Ford Fusion. Um, until I got like 5,000 miles on it, the car looks brand new. And I sit down, and I'm like, okay, cool. I just got to drive like 20 minutes and it's all good. Schedule's almost complete. And I said, okay, I'm going to reach over and I pulled out my pop and I said, I'm going to take me a drink before I take off. And I'm looking at the gadgets on this car, trying to figure out how to even turn on the lights. And I went to open this pop and I didn't realize that I threw this gym bag into the seat and it, somebody might as well have just shook it up because as soon as I opened it, I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I opened it and it just shot up, went all over the roof all down me and I'm sitting there saying oh this is stressful (laughs) like I mean it's everywhere it was on the passenger side it's in the back I mean it was shook up to the point that it looked like somebody had grabbed my pop and shook it up before I opened it so I'm just like oh my gosh so I'm reaching in to grab one of my shirts that I brought with me and I'm trying to wipe everything down and I'm like oh this just went from simple to like Sticky, right? I mean, I'm just going to be the next hour, half an hour to the hotel. I'm going to be sticky, soaking wet, look like I peed my pants. It was terrible. Um, It was just terrible. And so I get out and I'm driving down the road and from from the airport to the hotel, there's all these, this this construction is going on and it's crazy. And I'm driving down the road and, and I realized about two minutes into the drive that this new car was set up for auto correct. And I don't know if you know what that is. I never knew what it was. Um, I'm driving, and if I would get over to the left a little too much and even touch the line, this car would auto-correct, and it would steer, and we would go, and it would just start jumping, and it would put you right back in the middle, right? And I'm like, this is crazy. How do I, like, disengage this? This I'm driving down the highway trying to figure it out, and then I realize, like, there's too much construction. I'm going to end up having a wreck, and this thing's going to put me in a wreck if I'm not careful because I couldn't figure it out how to disengage it. 
But, but what it didn't do is it didn't compensate for the construction. So every time that the construction would take you over to the left or to the right, it thinks that you're just veering off sleeping. So it's trying to auto-correct while you're trying to force it into the next lane because construction, it just doesn't deal well with it. So I finally make it to the hotel, and, when I, and on the way, I'm almost pulling into the hotel. This is what I felt like the Lord told me. He said, that's how we make Christianity sometimes. Like it's that complicated for people. We make it that complicated for people sometimes. Like, like we do that. Like, like we, as soon as someone comes into the church, we, we, we put all these things out there. Like, this is what we are. This is what we do. This is what you have to believe. Here's all of our 20 list of doctrines and all this other things. And what, you know, just this is how you fit into what we do. And sometimes we're trying to autocorrect someone's life when they're just trying to get going. You see what I'm saying? Like, like I'm talking about when people are just coming into the church. We try to auto-correct their life to match what we've been doing for 25 years. That's what we do. We, we, we just, we just, it gets all hectic and it gets all confusing. And How do I know that's true? It's because I've seen people sit in church for months. And then they'll come and they'll say, hey, Pastor Earl, or hey, Pastor Josh, I wanna, I, I'm ready to commit, Right? And then they, they, the next question out of their mouth is, what do I do? And, and the elementary state of even saying that makes me wonder, like, what are we feeding them? What are we trying? If they've been in this church for like a year and, and, and they don't know the next steps when they're ready to commit, maybe we haven't done a good job of explaining the simple gospel message. The simple gospel message. I'm talking about the very basic essentials of what it means to be saved and maybe every one of us including me needs to hear this message about the simple gospel because we do this auto correct all the time in people's lives that's what we do we try to auto correct them we try to force feed stuff down their throat we just try to get them involved and and yesterday i was having a conversation with somebody and and trying to think about how do you get the men involved in church. And, and so I eventually come up with this. I was like, maybe we're asking all the wrong questions. <laughs> maybe we're asking all the wrong questions. Maybe we shouldn't be wondering if we can get them to go and jump on a go-kart and have fun with us. Maybe we are to worry about if they even know Jesus is their personal Savior. Maybe that's the simple thing we need to be doing. And maybe, maybe including myself, all right? So I'm in the boat, right, with everybody in here. I just want today to give you the simple gospel message, like what it really means if you're saved, what it really means if you're going to share the gospel with somebody, don't try to autocorrect their life, share with them what the gospel, the simple gospel is, just share it with them. What what is the simple gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's what you're going to hear today. And I hope today after today, I hope you walk out of here knowing for one, if you're saved. I mean, I'm just being honest. If you're saved, do you know how many people are going to be sitting in hell one day and say, wasn't I at church? (laughs) Didn't I go to church? And he's going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. How is that possible? It's possible because we don't understand the simple gospel message. All right. So I'm going to read it to you today and then I'm going to explain it to you today. So in Romans 10, if, if, if you're not, if you don't read the Bible a lot, I want to challenge you with this. Romans is probably to me one of the best books in the Bible, not because that God has showed me that. I just want to be honest with you. When we first come together as a church, Pastor Josh would tell me, he'd be like, Romans is like my favorite book. And I'm like, dude, that's like, I don't understand it, right? And the more that I study and I read in Romans, I realize that it is the gospel that we should be sharing. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's like the best book. It just is. So Romans chapter 10 is something that I want you, I can't explain to you enough how simple the message is in Romans 10. That is, listen to this. But what does it say? I mean, it's like real clear. Like, it's, I'm going to throw it out there. Like, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, One believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him 
and, 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 and will not be apart and will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be, what's it say? Saved. Saved. You know how we complicate this? Do you know how we complicate this? Like the whole message that, that, that the disciples were going out and they were preaching was this message right here. That there's something that goes on in your mouth. There's something that goes on in your heart. And you profess it. And God saves you. Now I just want to break this down for you. The word that's in your mouth. Can I, can I tell you something real quick? The words that come out of our mouth are more important than you can even imagine. Because the words that come out of your mouth speaks what's in your heart. It just does. It speaks what's in your heart. Whatever's coming out of your mouth is what you really believe in your heart. And do you know how many times, I used to hear all this all the time, don't profess certain things. Don't let the devil even know what you're thinking. Don't profess it because when you profess it, you start believing that things are true. Well, I don't believe that I'm ever going to get victory in this. I don't believe that my spouse is ever going to have a breakthrough. I don't believe that my wife's going to ever have a breakthrough. I don't believe that my husband's ever going to do it. I don't believe that my children are ever going to do it. When you start speaking that things, you start believing it because you're professing what is in your heart. And this is what the, this is what the Bible says. It says, with your mouth, you profess what you believe. That is why that whenever we are up here with, with simple baptism, a lot of people don't know this stuff, y'all. You know when we do a baptism, and you know how they do this little thing where we say, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And they say, what? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day? And do you believe that you need Him as your personal Savior? And they say what? Yes. Do you know why we do that? Because of Romans 10. That's why we do it. It's not something that, that, that pastors or churches just come up with. What we're doing is we're fulfilling the Scriptures of the proclaiming part because if they say no or I don't know, we don't baptize. Like if they were to say, I don't believe, what, I don't believe all that, then we halt right then and we say, well, you're not ready to get baptized because you're not professing, you're not professing what you believe. That's why we do what we do. So you profess it with your mouth. And then the second thing this says in this scripture, it says, the word is in your heart, believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. See, when you believe something, it changes everything else. You don't have to talk a man into being committed and faithful to church when he really believes it in his heart who saved him. You don't have to talk about being committed and surrendered and being in the plan of the gospel and the mission of the church if they're committed, if they love the Lord, if they're surrendered. Do you know that the day that I got surrendered, the day that I wasn't even in church, I was standing in a shower, I'm crying, standing in a shower, and the Lord, I mean, just spoke to me clearly, if you don't make a decision right now, you're not going to heaven. If you don't make a decision right now, your children are not going to go to heaven, and it's going to be your fault. You're the Father. Today is going to be, this is what the Lord told me, today is going to be the day that you're going to decide eternity. Today. We're not playing this anymore. Today is going to be your day. If you don't come today, don't worry about it. I ain't calling no more. That's what I felt. And on that day, I went from someone on Friday who would say the F word 20 times in a sentence to coming in on Monday, completely changed. Surrendered. No one had to convince me of nothing. Jack, I mean, you don't tell me nothing, Pastor. Pastor, you, I'm surrendered. I fell in love with the Lord. Why? Because something happened in my heart. And I started professing it out of my mouth. That's what happens when you get saved. Maybe some people in here, just to be honest with you, maybe you need to get saved. If God ain't the first thing on your priority list, maybe just get saved. We try to, we try to come up with all kinds of things. Listen, we make it way harder than what it is. The simple gospel message says, profess it with your mouth, believe it in your heart, and you're saved. It changes your life. That's just what it does. It changes your life. And here's what I love when it says in verse 13, right here in the same scriptures. It says, for, for everyone, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him. 
Everyone. This thing is open to everybody. It's not for, you know, just a certain group over here and a certain group over here and they look so much more committed than I am and they look so much more surrendered. No, 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 no. no. It's open to everyone. The gospel is open to every single person that wants to know Jesus as a personal Savior. It's open to you. It's open to me. It's simple. It's not hard. Believe it with your heart. Profess it with your mouth. And understand that it's open for everyone. Now, I don't want to leave out the baptism part because the baptism part is something that's required. And here's where it's at. In Acts 2.38, it's right up here on the screens. Acts 2.38, it says this. And Peter said to them all, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, baptism is more than just an outward profession of an inward change. I'm just being honest with you. It's more, in, it's a part of the salvation process because of the, what this says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. For what? What's it say? For the forgiveness of what? You want to know how to have forgiveness of sins? Repent and be what? Baptized. It, then that makes it, I'm just, let's be honest, let's throw this out there. That makes it more important than just an outward of expression of an inward change because of what Acts 2.38 says. It says baptism is for what? What does it say? For the forgiveness of what? Sins. Do you have to be baptized, church? Why? Because it's for the forgiveness of sins. Do you have to repent? Yes. Why? Because it's for the forgiveness of sins. If you ever have someone tell you, let's just, I'm just laying out some biblical elementary milk stuff today. If you ever have someone tell you, I don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. Your answer should be, then you don't know Acts 2.38. You don't know Acts 2.38. And then somebody's going to get real quick and they're going to say, but, but what about the guy on the cross? And then you're going to say what? You're going to say, that was before the new covenant was made. That was before, before the new covenant was made. Acts 2.38, the commission to the church. Peter is telling the new church, us, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So let's be clear, it's elementary, right? you got to believe it in your heart. you got to profess it with your mouth, right? That's, that's what you have to do. That changes you, right? you got to repent of all the sin that you did. Do you accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior? Yes. Do you know that, listen, do you know that you're a sinner in need of a change? Yes. You got to repent. You got to be baptized. Other than that, don't auto-correct someone's life. I don't, you don't understand, man. They really got a bad, filthy mouth. I know that. Don't auto-correct it. God will. You don't understand, man. They're really struggling with this or they're really struggling with that. I'm not saying we don't counsel people. I'm saying in the beginning stages of becoming a Christian, let's not auto-correct more than what the Bible tells us. Let me and Pastor Josh help someone through counseling and talking to people and holding them accountable. Let the leaders of the church, the elders and the deacons do a lot of that. But we don't need to auto-correct when someone just needs to understand the elementary things. Just the elementary things of the gospel. Now, I really got to thinking about this, and I really feel like that once you share that, once I tell you that, that you need to believe it in your heart, you need to profess, you need to repent, you need to be baptized, you need to understand that it's for you, you're not, you're not bad enough, for what God is offering. God is offering it to you. It's for everyone. That what we, have, we need to understand what is the responsibility once you know what I just preached to you. What is the responsibility that you and I have? Well, God doesn't leave that out in Romans 10. He, he, he says, listen, I'm not only going to tell you how to be saved, I'm going to tell you to, what to do once you're saved. Like, 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 what is your job now that you know Christ is your personal Savior? You don't never have to wonder anymore about what your mission is. I just don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to get involved with. Well, listen, I got what you need to be involved with. And the only thing that you really need to be involved with. All right? It's right here in Romans 10. And it says this. 
in Romans 10, 14 and 15, it says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And the next line is something that I believe that we all take out of context. And it says, it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We read that one last line and we say, well, okay, right here it's talking about just the pastors preaching about the, God, the good news. <laughs> the simple gospel message. Now I'm just going to become a spectator in the sport of church. And, and, and that's not what the Bible, we are taking that out of text when we assume that this is only talking about pastors. What this is saying is that once you are saved, you need to come to the realization that the priceless gift that you just acquired by doing the things that repenting and believing and in your heart and professing and getting baptized and, and this stuff that you know, the elementary stuff that you know, you are now put in a charge on your life once you know that. How then will they call on Him who they have not believed? How will they believe in Him who they've not heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching? Without someone going and telling the lost and dying world that they need Jesus. How are they going to hear about it if we don't do it? If the church doesn't go do it, how do we hear it? How do we, how do we get to the lost if the church doesn't do it? We don't. I, I, I'm just being honest. If the church is not commissioned to go out and preach the gospel, then it doesn't get done. That's it. If we don't go and tell people that there is something better than what they're grabbing onto and what they're running with, if we don't do the things and say, I believe and, and, and I'm repenting of my sins. Jesus, I want to be saved. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And once we come to that realization and we acquire that gift of salvation, if we don't think it's important enough to go share it to the world, we may need to go back and say, did I understand what I was really accepting back here? Because I don't know the, the, how priceless it really was. I don't know the gift that was put on me yet. Because I believe that once you understand it and it changes you, you want everybody to know about this gift. And the Bible says that if we don't go, if we don't tell, how are they going to know? And so I come up with a little list, right? Here's the list, right, of why we don't do that. Right? It's real simple. It ain't hard. Simple stuff. Here's the reason why we don't share the gospel. Fear is one. Fear. We don't want to look goofy. Have you ever really got into a conversation with someone and you're sitting there and, and you're realizing where they probably, like, like they're not saved. And, and, and we, we start thinking in our head like, like, well, they don't know the Lord. And then, and then God just is like putting something on you saying, you need to mention him. And you're like, mm, I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want to feel goofy today. I don't want to look stupid. I, 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 just, I, I, I don't know God. I mean, are you sure? It's fear. It's all it is. It's fear. It's just fear. Fear of offending. God, we live in a world now today, man, you do anything. People are offended. You can't even tell the people sitting in church. Like pastors, if we, we have to walk on eggshells when we say things like, hey, by the way, you know that God hates that sin. What? Like, I mean, we're, we're, the church is afraid to offend anyone anymore. Even if it's going to cost them their eternity. We're afraid. We're afraid to offend. Nobody wants, nobody wants to be offensive anymore. Can I tell you just something real quick? The Bible is offensive. I mean, can, let's just be honest. The Bible is offensive. Think about it. It comes down to one or two things. If you don't think this is offensive, I don't know what is. You either go to heaven or you go to hell based on a choice that you make. Is that offensive? <laughs> is that offensive? I'm thinking about it. Like God is saying, I sent my son to die for you. If you don't want to accept him, that's going to be on you. But here's the thing. It all boils down to one or two things. You're either in heaven or you're in hell. 
That is offensive. That's offensive. But I'm getting so tired of getting called, y'all, to do funerals for people that don't have representation from the church. I did one two weeks ago. Hey, can you come do this funeral of somebody that you've never met? They, they just never had, have ever had anybody in church that... I'm like, what? Like, that don't even make any sense. And then you go to these funerals and, and like, like, you show up, you have never even met them other than the very first time you see them is when they're laying in the casket. And you're their representation? Are you kidding me? If that happens to anybody in here, shame on y'all. <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. Because you go... Oh, they were a good person. They were, they were a good person. That ain't what the Bible says. Well, they're in a better place now. That's not what the Bible says. You're you going to lie. <laughs> you lying. Well, I'm just so glad. I mean, they're in the arms of Jesus. That's a lie. How are you going to go outside of, of Romans 10? You're going to declare, are you going to play God? Because God throws something out here that's elementary. You got to believe it in your heart. You got to profess it with your mouth. You got to repent and you got to be baptized or what? Or where are you at? Let's just say it together, church. Ready? One, two, three. Where? You're in hell. That's why we don't share it. It's offensive. And we are afraid that it won't work. Second, th second thing is it's time. We can't make time. We ain't got time to share the gospel. I mean, let's just be honest, including myself. We don't have time to share the simple gospel message because we don't have time in our daily lives to just stop for a second to realize that there's a world that needs to hear it. Like, we don't, we don't have time. We're too busy. I mean, between, let's just be honest, between the, the work and between the sports and between the, the, the gymnastics and the dramas and the bands and, I mean, the things that we want to do. And, I mean, we got to go out and to see this person do this. And, I mean, dude, we'll do anything and everything to do what we really want to do, but we don't have time to do the things that are really critical to the gospel. I'm in here too, y'all. And then we say, well, the world's changed today. Just people are just... Not as social as they used to be. We're more social than we've ever been, ever. <laughs> like, I know what's going on in my brother's life who lives in Florida. 30 years ago, that wouldn't even have been possible without picking up a phone and talking to him. But I know that he just went to the Marines ball. I know that. I saw him trying to get into that, that Marines uniform, you know, like 10 years after he's been out. I, I, <laughs> I text him like, yeah, nice try. That didn't work. <laughs> You might still have muscles, bro, but I know what you were doing. You loosened up some stuff, whatever you had to do. Like, I know what's going on. I mean, we're more social than we've ever been. It's not that. We just don't make time for the gospel. And this last thing really got me, y'all. This last thing rocked me to my core. It, 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 it just, it, this right here, my third point of why we don't share the simple message, you know, the, the simple gospel message, it's this right here. We don't see the seriousness of the situation. We don't know the seriousness. We don't believe the seriousness of it. That everyone needs to know where they're going. That if God changed our hearts, and if it truly says in the word that there's a simple gospel message, that we need to be sharing this simple gospel message. There shouldn't be a place to sit right now in this church. We've been a church for, what, six years now? How many years, Josh? Going on five or going on this March will be six? Yeah, sixth anniversary. We should be doing three services right now and killing it in Grant County sharing the simple gospel messages. That's on us. That's on you. Why? Because you, I mean, think about it. Do you know how many people in Grant County don't even go to church? Like, it's, it's like our, our pool of people to pull from is crazy. So this week on Friday, I woke up on Friday morning and I said, God, I want you to show me something. 
Today, I just want you to show me something simple and cool. Like, like something like just, just neat. So I got out and I walked, went to the airport where I was getting ready to fly out, and I went into a, a little store again to buy me a pop, praying that it wouldn't explode on me this time. And, and I, I'm like, I don't know why. I, mean, I was real careful this time, y'all. I'm just be honest with you. And so I go in and I buy it, and I'm turning around, and I said, hey, honey, have a great day. To the, to the elderly lady that was working the counter at the airport. Nobody else was in the shop. Nobody was in there. And as I'm walking out, she, she said, here's what she said. She said, it's not going to be a great day for me. <laughs> right back to the counter. I said, why can't it be a great day? She said, because I just found out today that I have cancer. And I've got like six months or a year to live. <laughs> and I said... Oh. And God says, how simple you want me to make it for you. And I said, I put my luggage down, and I said, honey, listen, I'm a pastor from Kentucky. Can I please pray for you? Now, I would love to tell you that I shared the gospel message. She cried and came to the Lord. <laughs> it didn't happen. She says, no, honey, you don't have to pray for me because I'm faithfully going to a church, and my husband is a deacon in that church, and I'm a firm believer that no matter what happens, I'm saved. And me and her, for the next two or three minutes, had church. And I was, God says, it's that simple. It ain't the fact that you led her to Christ. It's the fact that you turned around to go verify where she was going. So I walked out of there, right? And I'm like, have a great day, honey. She says, you know what? It will be a good day. I turned back around again. <laughs> I said, listen, you're going to have a great day. You know why? Because it doesn't matter what happens. Either way, you're a winner. She said, amen. And I turned around and walked out. And I walked out of there and I walked down. And I'm standing in the middle of Salt Lake City in Utah in the airport. The place is packed. No place to sit down. And I hear this, Earl. looking around and I hear Earl and I looked over and there sat Roger Fields and I walked over I said what are you what are you doing or, no actually he says what are you doing here and I said what are you doing here he says well I've been here all week for work and I said well I've been here all week for work and I sat down and me and him sat for an hour and talked about the goodness of God only God can do stuff like that. Only God. Simple gospel message. Wake up in the morning when you wake up and say, God, can I please, because I know how powerful this is, share the gospel message today. Please, God, just give me something simple. Even if you don't lead somebody to the Lord, God's going to do some cool stuff that day. Because you're getting up and expecting when you walk out of your house to see the, God, the simple gospel message proclaimed. Even if you don't have to proclaim it, God will put you in Salt Lake City in a place where you're buying a Coke where the lady will tell you that she's saved. And if she's not, then you have an opportunity. We don't make time. We get crazy busy. We got this going on and I got, I got this contract over here and I got to get over here because I'm going to go do this. And oh yeah, by the way, I got to be here at five o'clock and I got to do this. And we're so busy that we forget when we wake up in the morning what the real purpose is. How do, you, how, how do I know that happens to all of us? Because it happened to me seven years ago in the biggest God moment that I've probably ever been in. Seven years ago, and I've told this story about four or five years ago. Sorry, if you were here, you're going to hear it one more time because I believe it goes right in with the simple gospel message of what our purpose is. But seven years ago, a guy rolled into town that I knew very well, and at that time, he was like my best friend. And he says, hey, I'm going to do about 10 to 13 events in the next year. And the first one we did was in Grant County, down in the Crittenden Park. I'm talking about an event where you set up a 40 by 40 stage that goes 40 foot in the air and you hang like 
12 or 12 to 24, how many ever you want to hang of line arrays. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a week of just set up. And then you got to figure out how you're going to get a generator there and how you're going to figure out how you're going to get all these tents set up and get the stage set up. Get, get, you know, you got people up in the air, 20 and 30 feet, just hanging scaffolding and, and you're doing all this stuff to see the simple gospel message go out that Jesus loves you. And the first one, man, we go in there, man, and we're seeing God just do crazy, amazing things. That was, that, was, that was five years before that. Stay with me, girl. This is better than the lightning. And we rocked that event. Tons of people showed up. We were jumping up and down and praising God for a Christian uh, owner at Sunbelt, letting us have a generator. Man, we were praying over little small generators to run some blow-ups, and they wouldn't work. And somebody would, you know, uh, somebody said, well, have we prayed? And we prayed, and that thing started up when somebody had worked on that thing for hours. Starts up. We're celebrating, man. We go from, we go from uh, Grant County to Owen County. We do it in Owen County, the same thing, same event. We go from Owen County over to Gallatin County. From Gallatin County, we went down uh, south, and, I, and I'm getting some of them mixed up, but from down south, we come back, and we ended up in VV, Indiana, and we went from VV, Indiana over to Madison, and we had had about eight to 10 events in by now, and everybody was getting tired. <laughs> I was wore out. Because my buddy Ken, that I love Ken, and Ken's been a blessing to this church over and over and over again. And we support him and his ministry every month, if you didn't know that, for the last six years. And we get over there, and like goofballs, we let the devil get in. We're fighting over setting up tents, where they're going to be set up at. We're fighting over, should we set up our stage or use the, the drop-down stage that Madison's willing to give us. We're, we're fighting over who's going to be doing food or should we do clothes. And we're fighting over all this stupid stuff. People are gossiping and just, it wasn't nothing but just being tired. And then at 12 o'clock at night, we decided it would be a great idea to pull out some cornhole boards. Great, not a great idea when you're tired. <laughs> so we pull out these cornhole boards. And if you didn't know it, I just want to make a declaration right now. That me and Jimmy Shanks, as a cornhole playing team, killed everybody that we come against. Jimmy is great at playing cornhole. And we start out playing, and it's me and Jimmy, because we would never break up our little team. We didn't care if we was playing six-year-olds. We didn't care. We'd kill them. <laughs> it's how it rolled. And we start throwing them, and there they go in the hole. It's almost like Satan, man. We're just grabbing them and throwing them in the hole for us. One after another. I'm dropping like four in the hole. Jimmy turns around, drops four in the hole. And we're playing Ken McPhee and his 11-year-old daughter. And we're just mouthing. Mouthing to the point to where it was getting out of control. And Ken says, because Ken's competitive and he hates losing. And he says, I know what it is. Y'all just got better bags than we got. And Jimmy says, really? And he hands him our bags and takes his bags and the first four bags he throws right in the hole. And Ken lost his ever-living mind. No, no, no. When I tell you that a traveling evangelist that goes all over the world to talk about Jesus at 12.30 at night lost his ever-living mind. Jumps right in Jimmy Shanks' face and he's like, let me tell you something. And I'm like, oh, good Lord. Because I know that Jimmy's got two guns on him, and this might not go down good. Like, like, I know he does. He's got one, like, on his back, one in his sock. I mean, I don't know. I'm like, dude, you need to, like, back out. And it got ugly really quick. And Jimmy just, Jimmy said, I'm done. And he went over, he unplugged his RV, and he went inside, never came back out. And I, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. And I went over and went in the house. I walked in, I told Linda, I said, we're done. In the morning, we're rolling out. 
And Ken come over and he says, listen, I want to have a meeting at one o'clock with everybody in the ministry. Get everybody up. And Ken come under the tent and we all kind of complained, made our statement, you know, statements of what we were doing wrong, what we didn't like. And Ken says, we're going to pray about it all night long. I want everybody to go back into your thing. I want to get up in the morning and God's going to give us new purpose. That's what he said. God is going to give us new purpose. And only God can do what God does. So everybody goes in except for me and Ricky. So me and Ricky, we go over and we sit down in two sports chairs, sitting beside the river in Madison. And we said, how did it get to this point? How did we get here? So we got to have a meeting about fighting. And all of a sudden we hear something in the middle of the river. Help. <laughs> Help. And Ricky says, did you hear that? I said, it sounded like somebody said help. And all of a sudden, we heard it again, and it got louder. Help! And we, so by then, we're like, okay, this, somebody's in the river. We go over, right? And we're looking at the river, and we're trying to see what's going on. And in the middle of this river, the, the moon had hit just perfect and showed us a guy in the water in the very middle of the Ohio River in a rough current, screaming, Help! And I said, Ricky, we, we got an issue. It was like Ricky didn't even listen to me after that. Ricky starts screaming. Hey, we hear you, man. We hear you. Swim this way. Hey, just sw swim this way. He never stopped screaming. I'm like, I, he heard you. I said, we got to call the cops because if we go, uh, I, I can't swim that good. Ricky, I know you probably can't swim. We can't swim that good. So I go find a phone. At the, I'm hearing Ricky scream the entire time. Hey, we hear you. Swim this way. Hey. I call the cops and I said, hey, man, there's a guy in the river. Something's going on. I don't know what happened, but I don't know if his boat collapsed. He fell out of a boat. The dude's going to drown. You got to get here quick. And then we didn't hear anything. I said, I don't hear him screaming. He was screaming back at one time. And he stopped screaming. Cops show up. Ricky still never stopped screaming. <laughs> He's like, hey, hey guy, man, let us know you're still out there. Hey guy, swim this way. Hey guy, hey, we know you're out there. And the police show up and we say, there's a guy in the river. But he stopped yelling about five minutes ago. Cop tells me, he says, that guy's dead. If, 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 if there's really a guy out there, and I'm not sure you guys really saw somebody out there, maybe you just saw wood. I say, dude, the guy was talking back. There's a guy out there. You got to get a boat down here, man, something. And all of a sudden, Ricky never stopped screaming. And Ricky jumps the fence, illegally jumps the fence, runs down on the boat dock and still continues screaming. And all of a sudden, this guy rolls up on the dock right where Ricky is at and lays on his back. I said, Ricky said, he's here, he's right here, he's right here. And the guy says, get my dog. Come to find out, I want to just really quick let you know why he was in the river he was walking his dog down the bank and his dog would just go out about a foot or two foot and grab something and come back in well the dog had went out too far and then the dog was trying to swim back in and he and the guy realized that my dog can't get back in so he tries to go out and grab him and when he goes out and grab him he slips and then before he knew it he was six or seven feet out from the bank and he said before I know it he said in a matter of 15 to 20 seconds I was in the middle of the river he said, I couldn't tell where I was even swimming because when I got out there, the current and the waves were too high. He said, I, I lost all the lights on the bank. He said, I was swimming down shore when I thought I was swimming to shore. I was swimming down river. And we were like, how, how, but, but how did you get here? 
He said, well, I realize that I got to stop screaming back to you guys that you guys knew that I was in here. Then he said something so amazing. He said, I stopped answering back because I could swim better. And the only thing I could swim to was the guy that was yelling, come this way, swim this way. Hey, guy. He said, I was listening. Every time I would hear that guy scream something, I would swim toward what I could hear. And then I got close enough where I could see him standing there screaming, and I swam right to him. And we woke up the next morning. And I shared that story with everybody there. And I said, God showed us something last night. And I shared it five years ago, and I'm sharing it today. Every single person that is not going to heaven, whether they realize it or whether they don't, they're floating down the middle of the river of eternity. And the only job that you have and the only job that I have is to say, swim this way. Swim this way. Hey! Hey! I don't know who's listening. I don't know who's listening. But swim this way. You don't know who's hearing this. Hey! I'm not sitting in church right now. I'm out there right now. Hey! I know Jesus is my personal Savior. I know how you can too. <laughs> hey! It's simple. And if we scream that loud enough, if we take the simple gospel message to the streets, we can't contain how many people would be in here. I'm going to make a declaration that I made four years ago that did not come true four years ago. Everybody loved the story four years ago. It's a pretty good story, right? Right? It's only good if you really believe it. I'll make a declaration. If every single person in this church right now started putting God first in jobs, in sports, in our activities, me too. If we start standing on the shore saying, come this way, come this way, and that becomes our priority. Because in the end, when you're standing at a funeral, what all matters? Think about every funeral that you ever went to. What really matters? Where that person went. Did you have a chance to say, swim this way? Did you have a chance to say, swim this way? This is the way. I love the Lord enough to say, come this way. There, there, there's, there's, there's life when you come this way. Is it going to be all easy? No. Do you got to keep screaming it? Yes. Is there any guarantee that people are going to listen? No. But do you still got to scream it? Yes. Why? Because in the end, it's all that matters. It's all that matters. It's all that matters, folks. You don't have to know prophecy of numbers. You don't have to figure out every dream. You don't have to worry about if you're going to preach to thousands. You don't have to worry about how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that and how you don't understand this and how you don't understand that. What you need to do is go on the side of the shore and say, hey, lost, swim this way. I got the answer. It's Jesus Christ. He died for my sins and he died for your sins. Do you know how I know that? Because Romans 10 tells me that for everyone who calls on his name is saved. Swim this way. What's more important than that? What's more important than that? Nothing. You're getting ready to go to Thanksgiving dinner with some lost people. Your family. Walk out of there and don't tell them to swim this way. And you're not doing the gospel. You're getting ready to go to Christmas. Some of you are going to get in a car and drive states away. States away to go see family that you see once a year. You walk out of there as a Christian without saying, swim this way. Swim this way. And you don't know the gospel. 
I'm getting ready to go next weekend down Lexington with my awesome, awesome buddy and family where I get to stand around a bunch of guys that are just now tasting just a small part of freedom. Do you know what my message is? Hey, man, swim this way. I was in jail three weeks ago in Indiana. Do you know what the message was? Swim this way. I was in, a, I was in, I was in an airport this Friday, past Friday. Do you know what my message was to the lady? Even though she already knew it, I wanted to be clear. Swim this way. You don't have another job. <laughs> or you may have a decision to make. I make all this money, I ain't got time for the gospel. Hey, that's all right. You'll be just like 80% of the church will. <laughs> hey, I heard what you said and I like what you said, but I like doing this other stuff better. That's okay, because that's 80% of the church. Hey, I like what you said and it really makes sense and I even got a little tear in my eye when you was talking about the guy screaming that way. But it ain't gonna change my Monday. It ain't gonna change my Tuesday. That's all right. That's what the church looks like today. Who is going to stand and say, God, send me? It's a good message. It ain't a popular message. Why? Because this message right here, this message right here changes your priorities. Three simple pages of saying, listen, the word is near you in your mouth. If you as a Christian... Don't share what's in, what's in your mouth. If you don't share what's in your mouth, how are they going to know it? I know, but I would rather get drunk with my friends. Yeah, you would, and you'll rather watch them go to hell one day at their funeral. Yeah, but it's more fun, man, to go golfing you know, on a Sunday morning. Yeah, you can commit to that if you want. But if you're going to go golfing, you better sure the heck share the gospel while you're there. I didn't even mention it. Yeah, then you're wrong. You don't know the gospel. You don't know Romans 10. I'm not saying not have fun. What you know? I mean, good Lord, man. We try to tell people all the time. Well, you got to come to church every single week. That make no, that ain't what does it. No. It's time for the church to get out on the shore of Earth and start saying, "Swim this way. There's life." You can't just read your Bible and not go do it. There's life. I'm, I'm you. I'm you. It's me too. Some people in here will look and they'll say, yeah, man, you need to wrap this up. We need to get out of here. Well, you know what? You're the problem. You're the problem. Because you've been in church all your life and you think that this thing's just going to work itself out with some pastor that don't just stand up and start calling it the way it is. Church today, if we were to be honest, 80% of the people that sit in church on Sunday morning are not saying swim this way. And that, might, that sounds offensive. And if you don't like it, I don't care. Kick me out of here. I'll go somewhere else and share that gospel. I don't care. Go tell the other elders of this church that this was too offensive message for you, that your family, the one funeral that you just had a couple weeks ago, that they're in hell. I was at that funeral. I preached that funeral. <laughs> but it's okay. It's all good. No, it's not. We got leaders dropping like flies. We got men of God dropping like flies. We got women of God dropping like flies that God's got callings on their lives. And it's not a problem anymore. We just sit comfortable. Bull crap wrong man we got young kids that are holding iPhones in church and ain't no parent being offensive by it well it's I just make sure they're here bull crap take the phone from them stomp on it you know what I'm tired of you playing on your church on your phone in church we don't have parents to do that stuff anymore no I'm just getting them here you know why they're playing church because you're playing church that, that's why. You know why they're playing church? Because you're playing church. 
Because you ain't out on the shores saying, swim this way. You're not being loud. You're not being proud about this thing called eternity. Then when it all comes down to it, in the end, oh, I know this don't sound all fancy and everything. You know what? Hey, we'll just leave the band. You just sit down there today. Y'all, we do this stuff every week. Are they back here? Hold on. Let me check. Hey, y'all, come on out this way and just sit down for a second. Front row, that'd be great. I'm serious, y'all. Right down here in the front. Listen, we got, <laughs> I'm so past. I'm so past it. The gospel is offensive. And I don't care if I don't get a, hey, Earl, that was awesome today. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I'm burning up, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah, I want you right there, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> listen, listen to me. But I do want you to tell me when you kill a deer. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen to me, y'all. I'm going to wrap this thing up. And then we're going to sit down and we're going to have us a deacon's meeting about what's going on. We ought to be talking about what's not going on. Instead of what is going on. What's not going on is some people standing on the shores screaming, Hey, children, swim this way. Hey, youth, swim this way. There's life when you swim this way. And I ain't trying to come down on you parents. But the truth is, it's good God, if the church isn't going to do it, the world's not going to do it. I just came from Salt Lake City. 90% of religion in Salt Lake City is the Mormons. They're killing it. I'm going to tell you, some radical Christians need to go in there and knock that cult out of that place. And Josh told me this morning, well, that's where the Mormon, that's where it all started. That's where Joseph Smith started. Why isn't the church doing something about that? All Salt Lake City is is a, is a bowl of Rice Krispies thrown in there and a bunch of people live there. And the Mormons got control over it? What are you talking about? We got the truth. We got the truth. And it's high time that we as a church start putting our careers. It's high time that we as a church, including myself, I'm not just talking about you. It's time that we start saying that there's bigger things going on than the next concert that we can catch. Do you know some people get fired up more about singers than they do about Jesus? Oh, I love what Kanye West is doing. Oh, Kanye West has got a church. I was saying it last week. He's going everywhere. He's just telling people about Jesus. Well, what are you doing? This guy's been a Christian for less than a couple months. Think about it. He's been a Christian for less than a couple months. And he's out there making statements that he hopes Joe Olstein can get saved at his church one day. Oh, I know that was offensive because half of y'all sitting in here saying, well, I watched Joe Olstein. Bull crap. That's a cult. You can't get 75,000 people to come into your church. And then try to tell them everything's happy. Amen. Them 75,000 people are walking, walking out of there saying, I know, but I got cancer. I got six months to live. Life is not that easy. Oh, but Joe Osteen's message is just so uplifting. Yeah, you know what? The devil always gives you something to be uplifted about to make you think you're on the right page. That's a joke. The gospel is offensive. Heaven or hell? You ever seen Joe Osteen preach a message about repenting and going to hell? Heck no, you ain't. You know why? Because it ain't, it ain't true. He's a false prophet. And so is the other about 25 to 80% of what you see on TV. If you don't hear him talking about repentance, if you don't hear him talking about the blood, if you don't hear him talking about you need to get your butt off that couch and get into a ch local church somewhere and start serving, if you don't hear him say, you know, saying all that and all they're telling you is you send me $20 and I'll give you a blessing. God is going to bless you. Bull crap. That ain't right. 
Simple gospel message. If it's that simple, why aren't we doing it? I'm going on a rant today, ain't I? I don't care. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, listen. There's something in front of my name right there. What's it say? What's it say? I'm held accountable to tell you all the truth. And the truth is that some of y'all need to get your houses in order. Some of y'all out here making seventy-five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and ain't none of y'all even thought about ten percent going to God. That's why we don't have two full-time pastors in this church. Think about that one. <laughs> That's why I work at Mobia. Oh, I know. All the elders right now just tightened up. <laughs> it's all right. I won't tell the truth. There you, go. <laughs> you want to know the truth? Go ask them the truth. If you want to know the truth, go find it. But there's a reason. Folks, listen to me. I am not throwing this out there to offend anybody in here. But it's time we get our families in order. It's time we get our families, including our children, to stand on the bank and start screaming to a lost and dying world, come this way. I want to see a youth group in here that starts kicking out one whole section. It's time that our youth just start offending somebody and say, you know what? Nobody sits in this front row from now on. So how about we do this? Could everybody from this row, this row, and this row, and this row, y'all find a different seat next week. Every one of you youth, start sitting right here. This is your area. Let's do that. Let's start by getting them in the front so they ain't sleeping in the back. Let's get them in the front so they don't have their iPhone at seven years old in their hand. We can watch them. Don't think, don't think for one second. I am that guy. <laughs> I am that guy. You don't know me well enough to know this. You sit up in the front row and you sleep. How's that going for you? Wake up. <laughs> it's simple, guys. I'm going to end with this. Listen, we're not even going to do an altar call this morning. I'm going to pray. Y'all can just go on home. But when you get home, Pull out that dusty Bible that you ain't read in six months. Open it up and go to Romans 10. And you tell me that that should not impact the church. There's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. And it's time that the church starts believing it or we wrap it up. Wrap it up. Let's take the 10 people that will stand on the shore and scream, swim this way. But if you believe it, if you'll link with me, if, if, if I'll join you and you join me, and we start waking up every day and we say, God, today, show me the simple gospel message, and we keep our eyes open. By the time that we do Pastor Bow in February, we won't have to worry. We'll have to worry of whether the high school could even hold us. By the time that we wrap it up and we come back in here the next week after Pastor Bowl, our leaders will have to meet and not talk about stupid stuff. Like how are we going to put propane money, get money to put in a propane tank. But we'll be able to meet and we'll say, we got to have four services now. We got to figure this out. CJ, I know you've been traveling a lot, dude, but we got to figure it out. We're going to need like four worship teams. Why? Because we can't cover this thing at 1030 to 12 o'clock. So that you can be the crackle barrel by 1210. Let's, let's either do it or don't. Let's do it or don't. Let's see the law saved or let's not do it. I want to see the lost saved. They may not be screaming going down the river, but we got family that's dying and going to hell. And it's time that we get motivated and we do something. So after I pray, y'all have a good week. I don't care. Have, you know what? Have a miserable week. If that's what it takes to get real, I hope God put you through the worst hell you ever had this week. If that's what it takes 
to get real. <laughs> we always want blessed. So whatever it takes this week, God, I pray that that's what he does for you and your family. And when we come in here next week, maybe, just maybe, you'll have shouted enough on the dock of the earth that you'll have somebody sitting in here next week with you. I invited a guy last night. Me and a, me, I got a texting buddy on Saturday night that none of y'all know. Every Saturday night when we watch football, we text for five straight hours. Do you know we've been doing that all year this year? Do you know I've never invited him to church? Except for yesterday was the first day. And when I said it, I said, hey, you know I'm a pastor. I just want you to know, man, you're always welcome to come to our church. And then he went silent for like 30 minutes. I was like, great. <laughs> Dad, gone. You know, nice guy. And then he come back and he says, hey, I appreciate you inviting me. He ain't here, but I'm screaming. I ain't saying you're going to win him next week. But you got to scream it, man. Because if you scream it long enough, They'll row up on the shore right where you're standing and say, thank you for screaming. Raise your hand if you know the person that made the biggest difference in your life for you to come to the gospel. Do you know them? How much does that person mean to you that prayed for you, that went to battle for you, that stood on the shoreline and said, swim this way, this is what's right for you and your family? you got to be that person too. Lord, I come before you right now, God. God, I am far from perfect. I don't even want to have a meeting today with our elders and deacons because I want to watch football. Lord, forgive me for that. That's my own stupidity. When truth be known, I need to be going screaming at my own mom instead of watching the football who's laying in a hospital bed to swim this way. Then I got the answer. Lord, I am not worthy to be standing here today. God, I know that I've rambled and to half our leaders in here, it just they just sit back and say, dude, end it now. God, we are the problem. We're the problem because we're not leading by example, screaming loud enough, swim this way. Lord, I pray, God, that every one of us, including myself in here today, that God, in just a few seconds when I end this prayer, that God, each one of us are going to get up and put on a smile, maybe give somebody a hug, maybe even make a comment about today's message. But God, I pray today, God, when every one of us eventually get home, that we would sit down and have an honest conversation with you. Not about what I preach, God, but with you, God. Put that on their heart, God, to just have a moment with you to say, do I really believe this thing? Do I really believe in people being saved? And God, I pray that whatever it takes for the next seven days, you do it. God, we should be seeing people being saved by the thousands when there's only 115 names written on a board in the back. 115 names for six years. Not that those aren't important because they are, God. But there's so many more people caught in the current of life waiting for us to say swim this way in Jesus name I pray